So this is, look, we've had a lot of great panels. Um, we have two more today, this one and a panel with, um, with Vice President Biden. But, uh, you know, these are three of my most favorite people. Diane Ravitch, Stacey Davis Gates, and Tika Tony. And, you know, I know that uh, Stacy and Karen, um, Karen, just like Karen has been a mentor of mine, I know Karen has been a mentor of Stacy's. And so Stacy Davis Gates is the vice president of the Chicago Teachers Union and the executive vice president of the Illinois Federation of Teachers. And just FYI, don't get on the wrong side of Stacy. Just don't, you know, just don't do it. And if you don't understand or see that, just spend a few days with her, as I did, as the Chicago Teachers Union was on strike. Um, and then, and it's not just that we have lots of strikers here, but it just so happens that for this um, panel, we do. And then there's Tiga Tony. Tiga's from West Virginia, and Tiga is AFT West Virginia's Vice President and Director of Organizing and the President of AFT Fayette. Did I say it right, Tiga? I don't know, I hope so. Okay. Whew. You got um, <laughs> and that's local 4865. And yeah, you're gonna say, people are gonna say, okay, West Virginia, very different than Chicago. But you walk the walk with Tiga and with Stacy, and you're gonna hear a lot of things that are very similar about the way in which our nation has treated our children and our nation has te treated our teachers, whether it's in rural America or urban America, and, and the grappling with what we've had to grapple with, what we've had to fight over all these years. And so I am, I am really glad that these activists um, have joined us and joined uh, Diane and myself in terms of this panel. So I wanna just dive right in. We got about 30 minutes and let me ask the first question, which is, we've seen a lot of change around the narrative about um, public education, about teachers um, over the past few years. We saw what Michelle Rhee did, what even President Obama did, what Arne Duncan did, um, what um, Joel Klein did. So it's not just um, uh, uh, people like Milton Friedman or people like Betsy DeVos. We saw it from what, you know, what, we, what the corporate Democrats in terms of how they treated public education and public education um, educators. And so whether it was the strike in Chicago in 2013, the strikes in West Virginia in 2017-18 that spread across, or 18-19 that spread across the country, um, you could see, separate and apart from anything that we were saying, you could see that the public went from even though I would actually argue they never really believed in demonizing teachers, but you saw in poll results over the, court, over the course of time, in those two years, that instead of the focus being on demonizing teachers and on um, the quote, bad apples, there was a focus on the nearly impossible job educators have to actually educate and lift a nation and, and an appreciation for educators that is now much more um, sentient given what has happened in terms of, of COVID. But what do you think, um, so just tell us, I mean, I've talked to all of you at, about this extensively, but all three of you have been extensively involved in that shift. Um, talk about it, talk about your, you know, w what your role in it and you know what you were all trying to accomplish in this. And we'll start with Diane, and then this time we'll go Diane, Tiga, and then Stacy. Uh, thank you, Randy. Um, Stacy and Tiga are activists. They're on the ground doing the work. I'm a writer, and what I tried to do was to reframe the issues. And in 2018, when West Virginia went out on strike, I suddenly got hit by a thunderbolt that everything was changing because what started in West Virginia then became a rolling strike across the country that went from state to state. And I noticed, and I had to write a book about it. I, my last book is Slaying Goliath, and the Davids, or the teachers, the parents, the students, all of whom rose up to say, 
we value our public schools. Uh, our, our teachers are uh, are the good guys. We don't want them privatized. We don't want to have teachers rated by test scores. And we saw this massive, to, to my way of thinking, and I tried to reframe this, a massive change in perspective and in narrative. And the narrative changed from bad teacher, bad apple. Uh, Michelle Rhee is going to sweep out the Augean stables of all the bad teachers and bad principals. It changed to our teachers are undervalued, they're underrespected, they're underpaid. We need to be spending more money to support public education, and we have to stand against privatization. So the, the, to me, the, the one signal event was the change in Time and Newsweek. We had seen covers on Time magazine of Michelle Rhee holding a broom. Uh, we had seen a cover of Newsweek uh, that said again and again on a whiteboard, we must fire bad teachers. We, we must fire bad teachers. Uh, we had seen cover after cover on these magazines. And suddenly, Time and Newsweek, it was as though all the personnel turned over and they began <laughs> writing cover stories about the unappreciated teachers. And I think this is carrying over now into COVID, uh, where we hear parents or we see parents writing articles in major media saying, I am not a teacher. I can't wait until my kids can be back in school with their real teachers because they, they are the ones who can teach 25 and 30 kids at a time. I can't even teach two. Yep. Thank you, Di. Tika. Thank you, Randy. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm humbled to be on this panel, actually. Um, and a lot of people, you know, West Virginia came to notoriety with the, with the teacher strike in 2018, but there was a lot of activism that started even before that teacher strike. Um, I came of age in, of te in teaching in the age of, you know, Michelle Rhee, of waiting for Superman, of, of the high stakes testing fiasco or, 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 you know, the drive to do that. Um, and I came of age in teaching when it seemed to be in vogue to, to demonize teachers, so to speak. Um, and I, and I kind of want to step aside for a moment because I do want to point something out. I came from humble beginnings. I grew up in a holler right down the road from where I live, and I love that you use that term in your State of the Union address <laughs> yesterday or the other day. Um, but, you know, I know what public education did for me. I know what it did for my parents. I know what it did for my sisters. And no one is ever going to tell me that public education is anything other than the vehicle that it is to provide opportunity to all kids, but especially to kids who live in high poverty areas especially to kids who are marginalized or come from the minority communities. And so as a young teacher who was kind of coming of age in this, in this, in this um, privatization era, this high stakes testing era, you know, we had a lot on our plates. We had the problems and the issues that all brand new teachers have, right? Just struggling in the classroom, trying to find your niche, trying to find your way. Um, but also the, the struggles coming from the public narrative shift that the far right groups and the, the, the billionaire hedge fund managers were trying to put forth. And so I knew quite, quite, or quite quickly right off the bat that we had to fight this, right? And so I remember all the things in activism that I did. I remember going to every PEI hearing every fall. Um, and for those who don't know in West Virginia, PEIA is say, public. Tell people what PEI is. Yeah, yeah, uh, you're going to hear me say it a lot. It's Public Employees Insurance Agency. It's our health insurance. Um, and that was one of the catalysts for the 2018 strike. But, but, you know, there was activism before then. We went to the PEIA hearings. There were bills that were introduced before 2018 in West Virginia to, to attack our seniority, to attack, um, you know, or to attack public schools and privatization measure, measures, charter schools, vouchers. We beat all that back. But 2018 was different for us. And there were a lot of reasons that we could analyze why it was different. We had a huge presence on social media in 2018. We had a sense of awareness after the election of 2016. Um, and we were seeing firsthand what Betsy DeVos was doing in, in, the, in, the, in the Department of Education. Um, and we had a buildup of pressure from all of that anti-public edu education rhetoric that was going on in the country. Um, and another thing that we had in 2018 in West Virginia was a severe uh, threat to our paychecks and to our benefits. And anyone who's in public education knows that benefits are one of the most sacred things in this job, right? We're not gonna make a whole lot of money, that's the narrative. Um, although I would argue that we deserve to make a living wage just like everyone else um, and treated like the professionals we are. But our benefits are sacred. 
And so, you know, the the law or the the strike in 2018 was launched in a lot of different ways. We tested the water with activism, with Red for Ed days and walk-ins and meetings and Bennett Fridays and rallies, and then we went on strike. But one of the important things that we did in both strikes, 2018 and 2019, was we built community support. We went to parents. We got our boots on the ground. We talked to parents, parent organizations civic organizations and our messaging was how this is going to affect kids in our communities families in our communities um and and so we started a campaign with a lot of those groups called our students first and it's still active so we exposed how these privatization measures were going to hurt kids we're going to hurt communities we're going to hurt um, or, or stifle opportunities for our kids who need it the most and so a lot of a lot of those those tangible things you saw in our activism, uh, but the biggest theme was about respect. Respect for our profession, respect for what teachers and school service personnel do day in and day out. It was about equity. It was about justice for our kids. You know, West Virginia is a high poverty state and we have a lot of needs. Our kids have a lot of needs. We are ground zero for the opioid epidemic. Um, and it was about protecting public education for the institution that it is to promote democracy, promote opportunity, promote equity, promote justice. Um, and we did a lot of work in West Virginia in taking our seat at that table because that's where we belong. We belong where those policy discussions are being made because we are the ones in the trenches every day. We are the boots on the ground. And um, a lot of it was changing the narrative. It's teachers and school service personnel stepping up recognizing our worth, recognizing um, what we do, understanding that we had been overworked, undervalued for far too long, and we weren't gonna take it anymore, enough was enough, and stepping out and, 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 and providing that message, and the community was on board because we are also community members. We're union members, but we're community members and community builders. And so we did a lot of work uh, fostering those relationships, and we did have some election victories. Um, through that. So that's a little bit about the work in West Virginia and what we've been doing, uh, particularly in this state. I want to get back to the one about the other Mitch in a minute. So Absolutely. I want I want to make sure that we, we before we end, we talk about that election victory. Um, but let's get to Stacy. Thank you, Tika, and thank you, Diane. And let's get to Stacy, um, who um, I just, uh, I mean, Stacy also starts as an activist. Um, but she also has the kind of combination of uh, a sense of, of history and, um, and justice and, and organizing and activism um, that the Chicago Teachers Union has been known for. Um, but I watch Stacy um, in a really difficult situation over the course of the last several um, months um, uh, had that whole, finely honed sense of both justice and how to get there. Stacy. Uh, you know, we've been blessed in Chicago to have great leadership. You know, Karen Lewis came in um, in 2010 and basically set the labor movement on fire. Um, you know, she restored the pride and what it meant to put up a good fight and to participate, quite frankly, in good trouble. And we know, you know, as historians, as history teachers, that good trouble at the time is typically just labeled as trouble, um, as incendiary rhetoric. Um, and, and so the work in Chicago has been, quite frankly, instructive to how we do this work nationally. Um, I think we lost Stacy. Um, could the techies try to figure out how we get Stacy back? Yeah, we'll try, but maybe we'll lost the next Yeah. Oh, um, what we're going to do is we'll move on to, and then we'll get Stacy back as soon as we can get Stacy back. Um, and I'm just, I'm going to kind of ask, so why don't we do this? Tiga, why don't you actually tell the story about the Mitch? and Mitch as we wait to get Stacy back. Sure, yeah, I'd be glad to. I'm excited about this part. Um, so we have a Senate president in West Virginia. Um, his name is Mitch Carmichael. 
and he was the villain of the teacher strike in West Virginia. Um, he was anti-teacher union, or he is anti-teacher uh, union, he is anti-organized labor. Um, and he deserved our ire. Um, and, you know, people, he, 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 he mentions that he was the villain. He doesn't think it's well-earned or well-deserved. I absolutely do. Um, but I do want to, I do want to put a little anecdote in here. When we had thousands of people in the Capitol at West, in West Virginia, chanting and screaming um, during the first teacher strike, uh, my millennials, my brothers and sisters who are millennials will love this. You know, we had a chant, which was my favorite. We had a lot of chants. My favorite chant, though, was move, Mitch, get out the way. Because every single thing that tried to advance, he would stop it. He was the obstacle that we were trying to overcome. Um, and so he was the villain. He was the person who we directed a lot of our attention to in West Virginia during the 2020 election, primary election we just had. Um, and so his, he's in a he's in a very conservative district in West Virginia, the sen our fourth senatorial district. Um, but we had a public school teacher who stepped up to the plate and ran as a, a Senate representative in that district. AFT West Virginia backed her, um, and we did a lot of boots on the ground work to get her name out, to get recognition, so that she would be able to run a successful campaign. She did run a successful campaign. She want, run, ran an amazing campaign, and she actually primaried Mitch, and she beat him. So the, you know, I think the message here is don't mess with teachers and school service personnel, right? But um, we got rid of the villain of the teacher strike first opportunity we could. So Mitch Carmichael is not going to be the Senate president anymore. Um, we have a we have a person that we're supporting in that race, a public school teacher. It's poetic justice that a public school teacher beat him in his Senate primary, um, and we're excited. So we, we've gotten rid of our Mitch in West Virginia, um, and we want to help our brothers and sisters in Kentucky get rid of their Mitch as well. And this is, and, and the person who's running, and we're waiting, we think we're getting Stacy back, right? We think so. I, I think it's coming. I think Stacy's coming back. The person is a Republican, right? She is. She's a Republican school so, teacher. There's, there's Stacy. I just want to say that, you know, public education, and, and Diane actually has a lot, but I want to get back to Stacy. but Diane has a lot of knowledge about this. She's written about this. She actually worked for a re Republican administration. By the way, I heard that um, George Bush gave an amazing eulogy at um, John Lewis's funeral, which is going on right now. Um, but she, um, but there is a, um, Public education was never this polarized politically as an inst as as a value, and so the you know this is the DeVos, Trump, um, Bill Bennett kind of polarization um, is something that is the last basically 10, 20 years as opposed to I, I mean. Uh, there was always huge inequities, and let's not um, under uh, let's not um, uh, uh, look away from the um, from the injustice and from the racism. But <clears throat> that that's what was so so a Republican in West Virginia beat Mitch Carmichael in his primary. Stacy, we're back to you. Hey, you know this work in Chicago is grounded in community. Um, without having a race analysis, a class analysis about how we interact within our school communities, you know, we would be a failure. Um, teachers are common good practitioners. And in order for us to do what we need to do, then our list of demands, our organizing work, what we need in the context of our school communities are grounded in what black children need, what Latinx children need, what immigrant children need. But children aren't one onto themselves. They exist in families, they exist in communities. So when we say that a demand for us is to make sure that the 20,000 homeless students in Chicago actually have an address, that means something. When we say that if we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're going to need um, our students to have um, access to remote learning, then they, don't, they need a device and they need broadband. But we up to Annie. They don't just need, a, um, you know, something that's in the household. 
We need to have broadband become a utility in the same way that water and electricity is a utility. Our work is grounded in the ethic of the people that we serve. Teachers are common good practitioners. PSRPs are common good practitioners. Clinicians are common good practitioners. If you work in a school district that is almost 90% students of color and your work is not grounded in, does not amplify the message that their lives matter, then you're not doing the work of the common good. And so I, I would like to think that the resurgence of Local One under Karen's leadership made that a headline. I would also say too, is that we're not afraid to fight. I mean, you know, many of the leaders in our movement are history teachers. And so we know that when you get something, it's not because the 1% bestowed it on us. It's not because we said it politely. It's not because someone thinks um, we should have it. It's because we've taken it. And we've taken it because we've organized people in a way where they can see themselves, their, their needs, and their leadership in the work that we do. Thank you. I know we have a good uh, 12 minutes left, so I'm just, uh, but I want to get to, there's two huge questions I want to get to, which is, one, some guidance from all three of you. How do you see the intersecting crises that we're in right now? The public health, the reckoning with racial justice, the economic crisis. How do you, um, how, how do you see those crises and how do you see our role as both educators and um, I should correct myself, I said K-12 instead of pre-K-12 in terms of this panel, but how do you see our role as educators and our public schools and our role as unionists and activists? And frankly, Diane, I know you're a writer, but you're an activist too, and you're an honorary <laughs> activist of ours. So how do, you see your, how do you see these crises and how do you see our role in these crises and in fighting them? I, th I think the important thing for uh, teachers and specifically for teachers unions is to be the spokesperson uh, for the teaching profession uh, and also to take particular care to fight off the efforts to uh, privatize education during the pandemic. Uh, I think that everybody is very eager to get school working again but also very fearful that it will be open too soon and that the lives of educators, uh, support staff, and children will all be put at risk with premature openings. We've seen uh, countries like South Korea and Israel open their schools after a prolonged delay and then close them, some of them down again because of outbreaks. We really don't know how this pandemic is going to work out, uh, whether it's going to, it's certainly not going to magically disappear, as Trump says, uh, but we have to be very cautious about the lives of children and adults. And I think that right now the country is looking to you and to Lily of the NEA and to local leaders uh, to be the spokespeople for the teaching profession and particularly to ward off the effort to try to turn public education into uh, a tech enterprise. I think if, if we want learn one thing from this pandemic, it's that people really do value in-person instruction. They want to get back to school. Uh, they don't want to have uh, distance learning perpetually. Uh, I think that if the, the, the only good thing that's come of this pandemic, and I don't think anything good has come other than that, is that parents are really disgusted with distance learning. Uh, and I hear this from my own children and grandchildren. Uh, they want to be back in school. They want to be with their friends. They want to be with their teachers. Teachers want to teach. That's what the, the profession they joined. So we have to keep alive the dream that when school resumes, and someday it will, it will be better than ever. Uh, there will be a case to be made for greater equity, for greater investment, for greater equity. And I think that uh, this pandemic has also revealed the tremendous inequities. And I want to echo something Stacy said. I've been wondering why broadband is not as free as radio. Why can I turn on the radio and get the news for free, but then if I go to cable, I have to pay to get the news, the same news? Why isn't broadband as easily accessible to everyone as, uh, as uh, the, the municipal water, or the, in, in this case, the, the radio? 
because this should not be an inequity. Every child should have the machinery they need uh, to access their teachers. But I think that the long range vision has to be that when education resumes, it must be with professional teachers who have years of, of preparation and training and experience so that it's real school and not pretend school. So Stacy, I'm gonna to go to Stacy first and then Tika on this. You have thought about, I know you have thought about this a lot. So how do these three crises intersect and what as a union, not just what is you, but what is a union, your local, national, what should we be doing right now? So I have thought about it a lot. Um, you know, obviously I'm black, I have black children, I come from a black family. So the sanctity of black life is something that, you know, means a lot to me. Um, that being said, you know, our union in Chicago is clear about what liberation looks like. And liberation is both interracial, it's intergenerational, and it requires the labor movement to both provide infrastructure and to um, ally themselves with the movement for black lives. That's number one. Number two, um, we cannot save children. What we can do is that we can um, destroy systems of oppression. Like, that's our work in this moment. My work is to not make black children comfortable with racism and white supremacy. My work is to um, clarify their value as human beings and to create structures, to fight for structures, to win structures that create spaces for them to fully realize their potential. And then also, we have to work within the communities where we're located. We keep talking about you know, it will be damaging for students to not be in school buildings without acknowledging that our educators, they continue to teach. The building was closed, right. but the Zoom was still on. The Google Hangouts was still on. We made it happen. We put um, broadband on buses. We went to folks' homes and we figured it out. So it, this, this concept that we shrink in this moment and don't open up you know, new fronts and new opportunities for the type of justice and equity um, that our students need, we got to get bigger, we got to get more aggressive. Because this moment is one thing, this moment where 54% of black men are unemployed, this moment where we see black and Latinx and immigrant communities dying and being infected um, with COVID higher than anyone else in, in, the, in this country. But what's to come? is the state budgets in 2021. And those same black children, brown children, immigrant children that these headlines tell us America is concerned with will not take a moment, will not breathe long enough to not cut our budgets. Austerity is in the it's on its way, which means our pensions are back in um, focus, larger class sizes are back in focus, um, school communities without a music teacher, an art teacher, and, and a librarian, those things are back in focus. So what we have to do in this moment is to continue to organize with our parents. They took our workers in nursing homes, in hospitals, and grocery stores. Our work is to build um, organization across sectors. Our work is to lift up the sanctity of our students' lives. Our work is to make sure that the communities where our schools are anchored, have what they need, and that not only are we willing to strike for our safety, but we're willing to strike for the safety and the prosperity of the people and the communities in which we serve. Which actually leads me to, and then I'm gonna to get to Tiga, but what leads me to, um, there are several of our locals that are actually doing actions. When is it, August 3rd, Stacy? Absolutely, on August 3rd. Why don't you talk about it for a second, then we'll get to Tiga and then we'll wrap up. August 3rd, many of the locals around the country are gonna lift up. We need police-free schools. There's no reason why in Chicago I don't have a nurse at my son's school, but there's a police officer at the door. Um, we are lifting up the safety and the sanctity of the communities in Pittsburgh and LA and Chicago and Little Rock. And, and, and we need you know, the full voice, the teacher voice to say that enough is enough that rich people get to pay their fair share, and we get to have school communities that are not just safe, but are fully funded. Thank you. Tiga. Yeah, I think, I think what Stacy said was very much on point. Um, 
when I think about the union and our movement right now and, and what we need to do and our responsibility, it's heavy. It's great. We are going to be, um, we are in the middle of this crisis. And, 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 and if we don't step in, who will? We have to be the watchdogs. That, there's no other way to put it. It's as simple as that. We have to be the watchdogs for democracy. We have to be the watchdogs for economic justice, for racial justice, um, and with our healthcare brothers and sisters. We have to be the watchdogs for the healthcare justice that our students, our kids, our families, and our community members deserve. Um, I am a firm believer in my personal life that people are put on this earth for a reason during a specific time. And I truly believe that in our union. Our union is here right now for this moment and for this purpose. And to, as my sister Stacy said, shrink away from that would not be giving our members, our country, the justice that it deserves. Um, I do want to point out, you know, in West Virginia, I, we are typically referred to as, and I'm going to use air quotes here, Trump country. I hate that term, but that's what we're typically referred to, right? But I want to tell you something about West Virginia. Before we are Trump country, we are organized labor country, right? We are know your roots country. We are communities matter and are important to us country. And what we do in West Virginia, the work our union does, it transcends political lines because it talks about lifting up people who need help and need lifted up and who otherwise don't have those opportunities. That is our job. That is our mission. That is our moonshot. And so there are tangible ways we can do that. My sister talked about some of them, um, but it's up to us to rise to that occasion. I can tell you one thing in West Virginia that I think we need to do right off the bat is to recruit more minority teachers. We have a student population who needs to see teachers in their buildings who have shared the same experiences that, their, that those students have shared and that those students' parents have shared. We have to do that. It is imperative that we do that in my, in my area. Um, broadband was discussed, very important. I live in, and it could sort of be considered a broadband desert in some areas in West Virginia. Um, and it's so important, not only for our students, but for their families and for the connectivity to the broader world. Food insecurity, that's a huge, huge issue. We have to focus on that for our kids. Um, and to me, it's unconscionable that we are living in a time where we have more kids hungry now since COVID-19 started than we did before. It wasn't acceptable before. It's certainly not acceptable now. We have kids and their families who are afraid that come uh, tomorrow, I think, that they may lose their homes and be put out on the street. We are a union that has the ability to be the watchdogs for all this. We have the strength, we have the power, we have to harness that, look at that, use that as our mission, our vision, and with a laser focus, work to make life better for everyone in this country. Well, I mean, Di, what's your kind of last words to us? I think we've just gotten like a closing call to action from both Stacy and from Tiga. I was gonna say, give us our last words, but you two just did. So, <laughs> okay, Di, let, let me what give do you, you think? my last word and they can give you last words too. My last word is that I am hoping that in November uh, that Donald Trump will be dragged out of his office uh, and, and will have a change and that Joe Biden will be elected. And I'm hoping that y you and others who understand what we went through during the Obama administration make sure that we don't have a rerun of the Obama administration in terms of charter schools and a focus on high stakes testing and evaluating teachers by test scores, and that we have a new vision for education, which is focused on children and their well-being and the well-being of their families and their communities, uh, with it, and realizes that test scores are the end result and not a measure by which to force schools and teachers and communities to, to compete. So that's the new vision, and I'm hoping that the union will be the active force in, in bringing that vision to the Biden administration. I think, you know, you couldn't have actually, you know, said, I'm just, um, I'm getting notes from when we're supposed to start the next uh, session or not, so my apologies for looking down a bit. Um, you know, I think that that's a really important point, and frankly, when we did you know, Lily's not here with us today, um, but Lily and I sat on a very small um, Biden, let's Biden Bernie Unity Task Force, and it was about eight people, co-chaired by one of the um, Heather Gautney from the Bernie 
Sanders campaign and Marsha Fudge from the uh, Joe Biden campaign. And I don't know how the other task forces went, but what you just said, Diane, ended up becoming the arc by which we did the rest of our work. And it was really, and, and, and there was a moment where I actually pushed that if we're gonna do these things in terms of well-being and a real focus on the whole child and what are the resources that are needed to do that, both community as well as school resources, we also have to have a different accountability system. And I knew it was gonna be different when the reaction was not, well, we'll get back to you on that. The reaction was, okay, let's figure out what we can do in the platform to actually take on high stakes testing. And what are we really gonna do, you know, if there is a Biden administration, um, in terms of actually having project-based learning, career tech ed, the other types of ways in which we actually ensure equity and real engagement in schooling as opposed to everything being reduced to um, a measuring rod and schooling being reduced to a high stakes test. And that was the point when I knew it was gonna be, or that I was hopeful that it was gonna be really different. Because even the private conversation was not, you know, um, excuserama. The private conversation was, let's figure out what it means and how we get there. Um, and, and so, you know, I am hopeful, but as I think both um, Stacy and Tiga said before, and we've seen throughout the country, you can't, elections are vitally important. They do change the trajectory of a country. And we see there's going to be a huge difference between, um, uh, you know, a, 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 a Trump who just actually called for segregating suburbs again um, in what he did yesterday and a Joe Biden for whom he, you know, who has talked about what we need to do um, in terms of moving the nation forward to be more fair and more just. But, but the issue is not just elections. The issue is the activism that all three of you have done and that our union has done. We can't just outsource the, you know, the responsibility for everything that we need and everything we have to do to whoever the elected leader is. We have to actually do that check and balance. And that's what all three of you do. And I'm really, really grateful to all of you. And I'm just looking, do I have a minute or two for them? Oh, no, sorry. I am now told time, time, time. Okay. So, you know, this is what, this is what, you know, non, um, I mean, I feel like I have now done more producing and more learning about TV and how to do virtual than I probably have done in my entire life. So I want to just really thank Diane Ravitch, Tiga Tony, and Stacey Davis Gates. Thank you.